Um, one of the most rewarding aspects of being a professor at Mines is working with students as they make connections. In the mid-2000s, riding a wave of post-9-11 interest in public, uh, public issues and global issues, students started to ask a whole new set of questions. I've been here 20 years, and mid-2000s was a turning point. And those questions were absolutely different than the ones they were asking before. One of those questions was from a student sitting across from me in my office, how do I take my interest in engineering and combine it with my passion for social justice? Engineering, social justice. I was both baffled and intrigued. It was that question that was planted by multiple students in the middle of the 2000s that ended up be launching a journey that lasted over 10 years. That journey is my story today. It's the story that took me to the National Academy of Engineering to work on two National Science Foundation grants and also to publish multiple papers and a forthcoming book. So this combination of engineering and social justice was something that students were looking at. And for me, what's rewarding about my job is working with people who are curious, hardworking, and determined to find answers. And that's a great description of mine students. Um, in their first year here, they ask really important questions like, will I make it here? Will I make friends here? Do I belong? And in their final year here, they ask, can graduation get here any sooner? And after graduation, will I ever use differential equa equations again? <laughs> and more importantly, where will my engineering and science career take me next? In between that first and last year at Mines, a lot happens, and a lot of passions are ignited and nurtured. Last year, in a survey of Mines students, this group of uh, set of passions uh, came up uh, from the survey. And what you see there is a tremendously wide array of interests that mine students have and want to engage while they're here. That, that particular set of interests is um, interesting to me because I'm a professor in humanities, arts, and social sciences. And I want students to be able to, to be whole people, to engage these in multiple parts of their curriculum. One aspect of this process is working with students as they ask really, really important questions, like, who and what is engineering for? Who is best served by engineering? Who's constrained by engineering? How can engineering be a force to, to benefit and help prosper those who are traditionally underserved? Those kinds of questions uh, became very fascinating to me. And again, those seeds were planted by students in the mid-2000s. The next stop in this journey came about as a result of my work on connecting engineering and sustainable community development. Um, my colleagues and I were working on this book when we received an invitation to a workshop at the National Academy of Engineering in 2008. And that particular workshop featured people working across multiple lines. And one of those was people connecting engineering and social justice. And while we were at this workshop, we realized that this connection is something that we had not made in our own work, but it filled in a missing dimension. And we met the author at this workshop of this book, uh, Engineering and Social Justice, Donna Riley. And we watched as Donna Riley and several others had very intense sometimes heated debates with the head of the Army Corps of Engineers and others who were there about whether engineering and social justice should be separated or whether, as she argued in this book, they're already inherently intertwined. What we need to do is just acknowledge that reality. When we came back to campus, we were so curious about whether engineering and social justice have a connection and whether they are commensurable or incommensurable fields of practice. So we did what good academics do when they're curious, we wrote a grant. And this grant led us to work on an NSF grant from 2009 to 2013. In that grant, we learned a lot, but one of our key take-home uh, points was we 
defined engineering for social justice in this way. And this gave us a very clear set of objectives and also means by which to achieve those objectives. And once we had that cl clearly in mind, we were able to evaluate different engineering projects in terms of the degree to which they engaged some of our criteria. Another thing we encountered in our research is a disjuncture between engineering practice, that is, what engineers do, and the way in which young engineers are educated, that is, engineering education. The disjuncture actually comes from thorough research um, on engineering practice. And what it finds is that people who stayed in engineering, that is more than 10 years, actually found a tremendous amount of joy in connecting the social and the technical and making that connection very much part of their work. In fact, one of the leading studies concludes by saying most people found these challenges of the socio-technical to be the most interesting in their work. But this made us wonder, okay, so if indeed research on engineering practice accentuates problem defining and solving on really complex, open-ended, socio-technical problems, where do students learn that in their engineering education? So we began to look at different engineering curricula, including one of our own, this one, um, and many others. And you, of course you can't see the boxes here, but this particular section has all of the core, technical core courses, so chemistry, physics, calculus, and then it has upper division courses. In this case, it's mechanical engineering, so um, statics, dynamics, etc. And so we asked, is that socio-technical integration and problem definition happening there, or is it happening over here in the design courses, or is it over in my neck of the woods in the humanities and social science courses? What our analysis found is that here in the big space, where most of the credits are, students encounter mostly technical, predefined, closed-ended, decontextualized problems. Over here, in my neck of the woods, we did the exact opposite. We divorced, the, we, we focused on the social, but divorced it from the technical, with a few exceptions in both cases. Primarily, the socio-technical integration happened inside design courses, so here, and here. But if you'll notice, those are a minority of the overall curriculum. It's a very small percentage. So that made us wonder, okay, how do we address this issue? And more importantly, what's blocking that socio-technical integration? Well, the easy answer was engineering courses are very technical, and often my engineering colleagues tell me there's more technical content that can possibly fit in any given semester. And that's true, but it's an incomplete answer. A more complete answer acknowledges engineering ideologies and engineering mindsets. And those are up here. In the interest of time, I'm going to talk about two ideologies and two mindsets in engineering. So let's start with the first one, technical social dualism. So this one comes from a book in which an author of one of the chapters looked at how particular ideologies, which are circulating in engineering environments, but are often invisible to most people. It's kind of like the, the fish in the water. We inhabit this water, but we don't know we're swimming in it. These ideologies help us, uh, often hinder us from thinking about social injustices. So one of them is technical social dualism, which is just the idea that the technical and the social should remain separate, that they are not overlapping circles on a Venn diagram, but two completely different domains, which of course was the opposite of what we found in our studies of engineering practice. In about 25 years of research into science and technology studies, what they found was many of the case studies showed just the opposite, that there was an assumption of techno technical social dualism when in fact the two were inextricably intertwined. The next ideology is called depoliticization, which I had to practice five times so I could say it. <laughs> um, this is the idea that politics have nothing to do with engineering, even though engineering happens in a social context. 
It is not something that occurs in a vacuum. It happens in a society, and therefore it, it shapes and is shaped by politics. But depoliticization suggests that those remain completely separate. If you look at this technological artifact, you might just say, okay, so it's a short-handled hoe, big deal. How could that be political? How could that have cultural, historical, social dimensions? But if you unpack the history of this particular technological artifact, what you find is that it was used as a technology of control so that the migrant workers in the fields would have to be hunched over and the foreman could see from a long distance who was working, that is who was bent over, and who was not. And also, it was a way in which they ensured, because it's a non-ergonomic position, and it's not easy to talk when you're hunched over like that, that workers couldn't talk about things. They couldn't talk about forming a union or getting better wages or anything else for that matter. That, that was shut down. And in that sense, Langdon Winner's research reinforces why the technology, which may itself seem neutral, actually was part of a regime of power, authority, and control. Now that's an extreme example. In most cases, techno technologies and their political dimensions are much more subtle. And in fact, um, one of the authors uh, of this, uh, that discussed this ideology reinforces that they're often implicit in norms and ideologically infused processes of problem definition and solution. So an example is we often focus our technologies on low, co low cost, mass use, but that itself has ideological dimensions to it. So depoliticization basically has this idea that the, the political and the cultural and the historical and, the, and engineering need to remain separate. But that's going to keep people from thinking about how can engineering and social justice work together. The next step in our journey involved writing yet another grant, this one to integrate social justice concepts inside the belly of the beast, the technical curriculum, specifically one course called feedback, Introduction to Feedback and Controls, which is required if you're in mechanical or electrical engineering. And this particular course gave us an opportunity to say, instead of seeing this as a zero-sum game, where it's either students have technical content or they have social justice exposure, we looked at it in a completely different way. How could social justice dimensions help students learn the technical better? That was our research question in this research pro process. And one of the things we encountered is that students are very, very used to another form of technical problem solving, where the problem comes to them predefined. They don't have to do any of the problem definition that that's, turns out to be critical among what uh, engineer, engineers in the workplace do. That is, it's that complex negotiation between clients, communities, and other stakeholders about what is the problem in the first place, because each of those uh, stakeholders has different a different sense of what the problem is. And what we found is that when students get hundreds, sometimes thousands, of predefined problems in their engineering curriculum, it makes them have an uncritical acceptance of authority because they think, someone else gives me the problem, I just solve it. But it's not that simple. Problem definition is a crucial dimension in engineering practice. The final um, the final mindset is a willing to, willingness to help. And unlike the other ideologies and mindsets, this one is an opportunity, not a barrier. A willingness to help is basically this idea that anyone who's been around engineers for as long as I have, or, or, or even longer, recognizes that there's a helping spirit here. Engineers are problem solvers. They say, I see a problem, I want to make a difference. And that helping spirit is fundamental to good social justice work, like this work um, with a group of mines engineers um, building a bridge connecting two villages in uh, Central America. So this willingness to help becomes absolutely crucial in helping students learn how problem definition and engineering and social justice really have lots of significant overlaps. One of the biggest takeaways from our research was, came through interviewing juniors and seniors and sitting down with them in interviews and focus groups and asking them, what role do you think 
the social and the technical play a, a year or two from now, when you've graduated and you're out and you're actually in engineering practice. And their comments were, oh yeah, that's something that's really important. Both the socio-technical and social justice are important dimensions for practicing engineers. And then we asked them, what exposure did you have to socio-technical dimensions and social justice in your undergraduate engineering education? And most of them told us that with a very few exceptions, they had limited to no exposure. And we see this as an opportunity to integrate engineering and social justice across different components of the curriculum where it's most relevant. And some places are much more relevant than others. Our future work looks at how engineering and social justice can work in three particular components of, the, of an engineering curriculum. So in engineering design, the engineering sciences, and also humanities and social sciences courses for engineers. So one of the things I want to do is circle back to the mid-2000s when a group of students walked into my office and said, how do we make this connection between our interest in engineering and our passion for social justice. First of all, if there are any alumni in the room and you were one of those people, come find me today because I want to thank you and shake your hand. This particular research has been pivotal for me. It's changed the way I teach and what I teach. It's changed the way I do research and the way I see this connection between engineering and social justice. And in particular, what engineering can do to leverage social justice for a better future. I also want to um, thank the National Science Foundation for um, supporting us through two of their grants. Um, and most of all, I want to give a big shout out to CSM students, past and present, for doing what you do and for your intense curiosity, which has a ripple effect on us professors. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.